Chapter 26, Trouble at the Bookstore. The next morning, Poto was pleased to find more thwops in the garden. He took such pleasure in the overhearing Buzzard Billy complain about them at the tavern that Poto had begun looking forward to waking up every morning at sunrise to catch the little thieves at their business. Part of his daily routine was sneaking into Buzzard Willie's backyard, dumping sacks full of thwops, and watching them scatter. To be fair, after setting the thwops loose, Poto would sneak around to the front door and hand Willie a basket of vegetables, compliments of the flourishing Igaby Garden. Janet, Tink, and Lily did their morning chores and studied their thags. Tink was excited that the two art books he'd borrowed from Oscar were helpful and overflowing with beautiful pictures. Lily spent her time memorizing the words and melodies of several old tunes that Nia knew from childhood. But Janet sat on the front steps with his journal in his lap, staring out past the trees. Nia had asked him to write a book report on In the Age of the Kindly, Kindly Flabbits, but try as he might... Janner couldn't make it past the first few words without thinking about Oscar's map. Oscar and Rutip was quite a different man than Janner had thought, hiding secret maps and hoarding weapons in a haunted manner. Janner shook his head and smiled wryly, thinking about all the jewels his mother had kept secret. She wasn't exactly who he thought she was either. Do all grown-ups have something to hide? Janner, are you almost finished? Nia's voice startled him. He, she stood behind him, frowning at the mostly blank page on his lap. Janner's cheeks reddened. He'd been sitting there for most of the morning and had nothing to show for it. I just have too much crammed in my head to write about flabbits in the jungles of Plonst, he stammered. He stared at the ground, wondering why he suddenly felt the need to cry. He waited for a rebuke of some kind, but instead felt his mother squeeze his shoulder. Then write about that. It'll do you some good, she said, turning to go and I promised not to read it. He looked down at the quill in his hand and remembered the feel of the sword he had swung in the weapons chamber. It had felt good, like he was no longer a powerless boy in a boring town, but someone whose life could mean something, like his father's had. All the tears that had been gathering in him just moments ago changed into words and began to scratch them into his journal. By the time he finished relating the details of the last two days' adventures, the head full of questions they had raised, and the heart full of emotions they had awoken. His hand ached, and the ink bottle was almost dry. Nia called for lunch of hen meat, salad, and round bread, and Janner closed his journal with a feeling of lightness in his chest, as if he had been carrying a feed sack on his shoulders for two days and had just heaved it to the barn floor. But his mind still swirled. Tink appeared and tried to push forward toward the kitchen door, but Janner grib grabbed his elbow. Hen meat and round bread, Tink said, patting, patting his stomach. What is it? Jenner lowered his voice. We have to return the map. Tink's face grew serious and hid his hands behind his back, thinking about how much he wanted to keep the fingers attached to them. Do we have to? What if Mr. Atip finds out? He'll find out soon enough, and if he notices it missing, I'm sure he'll suspect we took it. I think our safest option is to try to slip it back when he's not looking. Trust me, we'll do it today when we go to the bookstore. They gobbled down lunch and headed out, Lily and Nugget in tow. Once again, Poto escorted them into town as far as Shaggy's tavern. After I chew the bone with Shaggy for a spell, I'm heading home to tend to the garden. I'll be back to get you at sundown. With the warning to be wary and to stick together, he sent them on, complaining loudly about his overwhelming thirst. Lily hadn't yet adventured into town since the Sea Dragon Festival, and she was anxious. But the sun was bright, and the townspeople seemed their usual selves, so her spirits soon lightened, and she took to humming while she limped along behind her brothers. They waved at the Blaggis boys, who were pushing a wheelbarrow full of garden tools they had just acquired by spending the, moon, the morning filling out a stack of tool-use forms. The fangs were at their usual place in front of the jail, laughing wickedly with one another and sneering at the glip folk who passed. Janner was relieved to see no sign of either Slarp or Commander Norm. Zuzab sat on the roof of books and crannies with his legs crossed, juggling three stones and watching the children approach. Hello, children, he said in his quiet way. Have you come to return something? Janner and Tink stole a glance at one another. Did Zuzab know that they'd taken the map? Janner told himself it was a guilty conscience. They waved at him, Janner trying to, send, trying to be as pleasant as he could with the strange little ridge runner, though he always found that difficult. 
Zuzeb's eyes seemed to be studying him in a way that was familiar to Janner, though he couldn't place why. We've come to see if Lily can here can borrow a few books, Janner said. I'm sure that will be nice, Zuzeb replied pleasantly enough as he slunk backward out of sight. Janner watched the Ridge Runner vanish and remembered Nicholas, Ferenia Swappleton's cat. It was usually seen lazing in the shade of the front stoop of the flower shop, licking its paws. But sometimes, when a butterfly bounced through the air in front of it, the cat would spring to its feet and watch the insect with a cold, careful intensity. Janna realized that when Zuzab watched him, he felt like the butterfly. He shuddered and hurried into the bookstore to find Oscar in his office, hunkered over a huge volume at his desk. The Uga B3, come in, come in. He spread his arms wide and waved them in. His expression turned to one of horror, however, when he saw Nugget padding along beside Lily. Oh, no dogs, lass. First thing you know, he'll be gnawing on some old, one-of-a-kind book of mine. He shoved Nugget. He shooed Nugget out of the back door to Lily's disappointment, noticing Oscar's expression softened, but only a little. As the great animal trainer, Yakov Bruges, right? Uh, let me see. How did that go? Oscar closed his eyes with the finger in the air. Ah, that's it. Like it or not, the dog stays outside. A wise fellow Yakov was. So Yakov Burrs abhorred all manner of animal abuse. Most of all, the habit of referring to pets as a baby and attributing to them animal characteristics. Yakov's first wife, Zaga, esteemed her two Beckett Terriers so much she insisted they sit at the table with them at dinner, that they sleep at the foot of their bed. Yakov, whose communication skills with all manner of animals was unmatched, failed to convince Zaga that her babies detested the eating practices of humans and would rather have not worn the matching lavender lace pajamas to sleep in their human bed. Late one fateful night when Zaga was fast asleep, Yakov tiptoed to the foot of the bed, gathered Shputsi and Kiki carefully in his arms, carried them outside, drew from his sleeve a sharp knife, and put them out of their misery. Which is to say that he cut the lavender lace pajamas from the oppressed dogs and set them running free in the moonlight, never to return. It's said that once word of a dog's deliverance at the hands of the mighty Yakov Burrs spread among dog kind, wherever Yakov passed, all breeds of dogs yowled and respectfully rolled onto their backs. Nothing is more nothing more is known of Zaga. Lily motioned for the nugget to wait for her beside the loading door in the back, where the crates full of books had been. Oscar then escorted Lily through the store to find the section of music. Jenner and Tink wandered through the maze of shelves for half an hour before Tink found the loose panel just below the shelf labeled Itchy Rash Remedies and Anecdotes. The snotbox candle was still in its place. Is he nearby? Tink asked, looking up and down the aisle. Janner walked to the end, peeking around the corner and shook his head. Tink wiggled the panel loose, pulled the map from his sleeve, and slipped it beneath the shelf. As he replaced the panel, they heard a quiet voice above them. Drop something, Zuzab said. He was perched on top of the high shelf above them, smiling. Janner and Tink tried to smile back. Tink told him that he'd seen a wooden mouse scurrying about and was trying to catch it before it ruined any of Oscar's books. Oh, yes, I see wood mice in here all the time, Zuzab said. I just... Quick as a flash, Zuzab scurried down the shelf and pretended to snatch at something. Sneak up and grab them before they even know what's happened. Tink and Janner smiled uncomfortably, still not sure what to think of Zuzab Coit. Zuzab scurried back up the shelf and disappeared again. Janner elbowed Tink and nodded toward the entrance. For another 15 minutes, they took wrong turns after wrong turn trying to find Lily and Oscar. They eventually found Oscar very pleased with himself, holding a stack of at least ten large volumes, all on the subject of the whistle harp. Where's Lily? Jenner asked. Eh? Oscar said, peering down at them through his spectacles. Oh, she went to check on that little dog of hers a while ago. Jenner's heart skipped a beat. Their first time in town since the incident that nearly killed them, and already he didn't know where she was. He told himself that he was overreacting, but the sick feeling in his stomach sent him running and calling her name, leaving Tink and Oscar standing there speechless. Janner darted to and fro through the maddening twists and turns of the narrow aisles, trying to find his way to the back to the office. He rounded a corner and skid skidded to a stop right in front of Oscar and Tink, who had not moved. 
He was back where he started. I have to find Lily! Janner exploded. Oscar blinked, shocked at Janner's tone of voice, but he dropped the books to the floor in a heap and shuffled forward, leading the way as fast as possible with Tink in the rear. Janner moved past him when he saw the office ahead and burst through the back door, praying that Lily would be sitting there in the grass, scratching Nugget's belly. But she was nowhere to be seen. The area behind Books and Crannies was empty except for the stack of old crates piled there two days prior. Beside the crates, beside the crates lay Lily's new lizard kicker crutch. Janner felt his insides quake. He couldn't believe that already he had failed to protect his sister, and he had the sinking feeling that this time they wouldn't get out of it unscathed. He was dimly aware of Tink yelling Lily's name as loudly as he could, and Oscar shuffling around the corner of the building, calling for Lily too. Janner dropped to his knees on the verge of tears. He was cycling through the feelings of anger towards Lily for stepping outside alone, anger toward Oscar for leaving her even for a moment, and guilt for once again failing Poto, Nia, and most importantly, Lily. Oscar came back around the corner. She's not here, he said, worriedly adjusting his spectacles. Suddenly, Nugget appeared, favoring one leg and whining. Nugget! Tink cried. He ran over to the little dog. Where's Lily, boy? Lily? Nugget pointed his nose across the field behind Oscar's shop and barked. There, said Zuzab from above them. He was standing on the roof again, pointing north toward a little cluster of trees. I can see something moving. There. Is it her? Janner demanded, scrambling to his feet. It appears to be a fang, and yes, it's carrying something. I believe it's her, Zuzab finished the note of sadness in his voice. With a roar, Janner leapt to his feet and ran as fast as he could for home. His only thought was that he had to find Poto because Poto would know what to do. Janner and Tink both screamed his name the whole way up the lane to the cottage, and Poto, who had been hoeing in the garden, dropped his hoe and ran, stump and all, to meet them. Where's my granddaughter? He bellowed. Between breaths, Janner told him what happened, and in the middle of the story, he started crying. He felt stupid for it, but he couldn't hold back the tears any longer. Tink stood beside him awkwardly, staring at the ground and praying that Poto wouldn't be too hard on his big brother. Without a word, Poto wheeled around and dashed to the barn. Grandpa, what do we do? Tink called after him. Poto emerged from the barn, suddenly astride their old cart horse, Danny. But both Poto and Danny looked different. Danny was galloping like a war horse, his mane whipping around like it was on fire. And there he, and there on his bare back sat Poto, wild white hair flying, his back hunched forward as he urged the horse on. Janner thought his grandfather looked ten years younger and twice as strong. Stay here, Poto growled. But, Janner said, stay here, Poto roared. The veins stood out on his neck, and his face turned red as a plum. He galloped away toward down the lane toward town, leaving his grandson staring after him in awe.